Hello again for anyone just now tuning in. Be reading from Kantian's essay on economic theory, which is really, or at least was, an esoteric script passed around in elite circles. Way back before our time, before America's time, in the light here, and chapter one here, wealth. Uh, everyone has a different concept of where things are going, where things should go. The idea of this fourth turning, changing times. We can think about whether things do change or not. How we could do that. And we can uh, question whether these things explained here are applicable to our day and time frame. And how we might understand things for ourselves going forward. So, chapter 1. Wealth. On the abstract, Kantian defines wealth as the consumption of goods produced by land and labor. This contrasted with the mercantilist who thought money was wealth. Land is the source or matter from which all wealth is drawn. Man's labor provides the form for its production, and wealth in itself is nothing but the food, conveniences, and pleasures of life. Land produces grass, roots, grain, flax, cotton, hemp, shrubs, and several kinds of trees with fruit, bark, foliage, like that of the mulberry tree for silkworm. And it supplies mines and minerals. From these, the labor of man creates wealth. Rivers and seas provide fish for the food of man and many other things for his enjoyment, but these seas and rivers belong to the adjacent land or are common to all, and man's labor extracts fish and other advantages from them. Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Human Societies all human societies are based on a system of property rights. The distribution of rights will necessarily be unequal. Unequal. And the use to which property is put will be dependent on the tastes of the owners. Whichever way a society of men is formed, the ownership of the land they inhabit will necessarily belong to a number a small number among them. In nomadic societies like the Tartar hordes and Indian tribes who go from one place to another with their animals and families, the kings or leader must fix the boundaries for households and neighborhoods around the camp. Otherwise, there would always be disputes over living quarters or access to life's conveniences, such as forests, pastures, and water, etc. However, when the districts and boundaries are settled for all, it is as good as ownership while they stay in that place. In the more settled societies, if a prince at the head of an army has conquered a country, he will distribute the land among his officers or friends according to their merits or his pleasures, as was originally the case in France. He will then establish laws to maintain property rights for them and their descendants, or he will reserve the ownership of the land to himself and employ his officers or friends to cultivate it. He also may grant the land to them on condition that they pay an annual royalty or rent, 
or he may grant it to them while reserving the right to tax them every year according to his needs and their capacity. In all these cases, the officers or friends, whether independent owners or dependents, whether administrators or survivors of the production of the land, will be few in number compared to all the inhabitants. It says as a note, the Mongols under Genghis Khan captured territories from the Pacific Ocean to Poland and from Russia to the Middle East and India and established the Mongol Empire, the largest contiguous empire in the world during the 13th and 14th century. Even if the prince distributes the land equally among all the inhabitants, it will ultimately be divided among a small number. One man will have several children and will not be able to leave each of them a portion of the land to his own. Another will die without children and will leave his portion to someone who has land already, rather than to one who has none. A third will be lazy, extravagant, or sickly, and be obliged to sell his portion to someone more frugal and industrious, who will continually add to his estate by new purchases, on which he will employ the labor of those who have no land of their own, are obliged to offer him their labor in order to subsist. At the first settlement of Rome, each citizen was given two units of land, yet soon after there was as great an inequality among inheritances as we observe today in all the countries of Europe. The land eventually was divided among a few owners. Assuming then that the land of the new country belonged to a small number of people, each owner will manage his land himself or lease it to one or more farmers. In this economy, it is essential that the farmers and laborers should have a living, whether the land is exploited by the owner or by the farmers. The owner receives the surplus of the land, and he will give part of it to the prince or the government, or the farmers will give this part directly to the prince on behalf of the owner. As for the use to which the land should be put, the first necessity is to employ part of it for the maintenance and food of those who work the land and make it productive. The rest depends mainly upon the desires and lifestyle of the prince, the lord of the state, and the property owner. If they are fond of wine, vineyards must be cultivated. If they are fond of silks, Mulberry trees must be planted and silkworms raised. Moreover, part of the land must be employed to support those who supply these wants. If they delight in horses, pastures are needed, and so on. Cantian wrote that each person receives two jarnocks, which is approximately two acres of land. However, if we assume that the lands belong to no one in particular, it is difficult to conceive how a society of men can be formed there. We see, for example, that for the communal lands of a village, there is a fixed number of animals that each of the inhabitants are allowed to maintain. And if the land were left to the first occupier in, the new in a new conquest or discovery of the country, the establishment of ownership would inevitably have to be based on some rule of order for a society to be established. Whether the rule is determined by force or by law. And so on to chapter 3, Villages. In this first of four chapters on economic geography and location theory, Kantian explains that settlements are based on the requirements of production, especially the quantity of labor and the extent of the, specialized, the specialization and division of that labor. However, the land is used, whether pasture, wheat, vineyards, etc., the farmers or laborers who carry on the work must live nearby. Otherwise, the time spent going to their fields and returning to their houses will consume too much of the day. Hence the necessity for villages widespread in all the countryside and cultivated lands. 
where there also must be enough blacksmiths and wagon makers for the tools, plows, and carts that are needed, especially when the village is far from the towns. The size of the village is naturally proportioned to the number of inhabitants the land requires for daily work, and to the artisans who find enough employment there by serving the farmers and laborers. However, these artisans are not quite so necessary in the vicinity of towns where the laborers can travel without much time of loss, or loss of time. If one or more of the property owners reside in the village, the number of inhabitants will be greater in proportion to the domestic servants and artisans attracted there, and inns will be established for the convenience of the domestic servants and workmen who earn a living from the property owners. If the land is only suitable for maintaining sheep, as in the sandy districts and moorlands, the villages will be fewer and smaller because only a few shepherds are required on the land. If the land consists of sandy soil, where only trees grow and there is no grass for livestock, and it is distant from towns and rivers, the trees will be useless for consumption. As in many areas of Germany, there will only be as many houses and villages as are needed to gather acorns and feed pigs in season, and if the land is sterile, there will be no villages or inhabitants. So that was chapter 3. Chapter 4. Market Towns Entrepreneurs establish markets in centrally located villages which provide the necessary conditions under which prices are established between supply and demand. The size of the market town depends on the size of the economy it serves. There are villages where markets have been established by the interest of some property owners or royal residents. These markets, held once or twice a week, encourage several little entrepreneurs and merchants to establish themselves there. In the market, they buy the products bought from the surrounding villages in order to transport them to the large town for sale. In the large towns, they exchange them for iron, salt, sugar, and other merchandise, which they sell on the market days to the villagers. Many small artisans, like locksmiths, cabinet, cabinet makers, and others, also settle down in these places to serve the villages. And as a result, these villages become market towns, a market town being located in the center of the villages, whose people come to the market it is naturally easier for the villagers to bring their products for sale on market days and to buy the articles they need than it would be for merchants and entrepreneurs to transport the merchandise to the villages and exchange them for the villagers' products. So one, for the merchants to go around, the villages would unnecessarily increase the costs of transportation. So the merchants can't just run around or it would you know, cost that much more. As I know, it was long believed that J.B. Say had introduced the term entrepreneur to economics, but Kantian was the first to employ the term extensively in economic analysis. So this says, so one, the merchant, the merchants go around the village, going around the village would be unnecessarily or the, the merchants going around the village would unnecessarily increase the cost. Two, the merchants would perhaps be obliged to go to several villages before finding the quality and quantity of products that they wish to go to, or that they wish to buy. The villagers would generally be in their fields when the merchants arrived, and not knowing what products and merchants desired, they would have nothing prepared and ready for sale. It would be almost impossible to fix the price of a product and the merchandise in the villages. Between the merchant and the villagers, in one village, the merchant would refuse the price asked for the product, hoping to find it cheaper in another village, and the villager would refuse the price offered for his merchandise, in the hope that another merchant would come along and take it on better terms. All these difficulties are avoided when the villagers come to town on market days to sell their product and to buy things that they need. Prices are fixed by 
the proportion between the products displayed for sale and the money offered for it. These, this takes place in the same spot under the eyes of all villagers of different villages and of the merchants or entrepreneurs of the town. When the price has been settled between a few, the others follow without difficulty, and so the market price of the day is determined. The peasant then goes back to his village and resumes his work. The size of the market town is naturally proportioned to the number of farmers and laborers needed to cultivate the lands dependent on it, and to the number of artisans and small merchants that the village is bordering on the market town employ with their assistants and horses. Finally, it also depends on the number of persons supported by the property owners who live in the town. When the villages associated with the market town, i.e. who ordinarily sell their products in, in a particular market town, are sizable and have a large output, the market town will become considerable and large in proportion. However, when the neighboring villages have little production, the market town also is poor and insignificant. Notice that Kentian use the phrase naturally proportional. He uses the word proportion throughout the book when he is explaining naturally equilibrating and harmonious human processes that are self-regulating, especially economic processes, not in the sense of exact ratios and percentages. So chapter 5, Cities. Cities form at sites where large property owners have decided to live. Specialization of labor expands to meet the demand of the wealthy. Cities grow even larger when manufacturing industries produce for export. And whose workers are essentially supported by the production of foreign lands. Kantian placed a great deal of emphasis on transportation costs. He found that property owners who lived far from their lands would experience a reduction in income proportional to the cost of transporting their products to market. The property owners who only have small estates usually reside in market towns and villages near their lands and farms. The transportation of their production to distant cities would not enable them to live there comfortably. However, property owners that own several large estates have the means to live at a distance from them and enjoy the pleasant society with their property owners and nobility of the same species. If a prince or noble who has received large grants of land at the time of a conquest or discovery of a country fixes his residence in some peasant spot, and several other lords come to live there, to be within reach of each other and to enjoy a pleasant society, this place will become a city. Great houses will be built for the nobility in question, and many more will be built for the merchants, artisans, and people of all sorts of professions who will be attracted there. These noblemen will require bankers, butchers, brewers, wine merchants, and manufacturers of all kinds to service their needs. These entrepreneurs will in turn build houses in this location, or will rent houses built by other entrepreneurs. There is no great nobleman whose expense upon his house, his retinue, and servants does not maintain merchants and artisans of all kinds, as it may be seen from the de detailed calculation that I made for the supplement of this essay, which I don't think is, which I don't think is available. All these artisans and entrepreneurs serve each other, as well as the nobility. The fact that their upkeep ultimately falls on the property owners and nobles is often overlooked. It is not perceived that all the little houses in a city, such as we have described, depend upon this and subsist at the expense of the great houses. However, it will be shown later that all the classes and inhabitants of a state live at the expense of the property owners. The city in question will grow larger if the king 
or the government establishes law courts to which the people of the market towns and villages of the province must have recourse. An increase in number of entrepreneurs and artisans of every sort will be needed for the maintenance of the judges and lawyers. miss anything. So if in this same city workshops and factories are established to manufacture beyond home consumption for export and sale abroad, the city will be large in proportion to the workmen and artisans who live there at the expense of foreigners. However, if we put aside these considerations, in order to not complicate our subject, we may say that the gathering of several rich property owners living in the same place suffice to form what is called a city. Many cities in Europe, mainly in the interior, owe the number of their inhabitants to the assemblage, to this assemblage. In this case, the size of the city is naturally proportioned to the number of property owners living there, or rather to the production of the land which belongs to them, minus the cost of transportation to those whose lands are the farthest away and the part that they are obliged to give to the king or the government, which is usually consumed in the capital. Briefly put, all foods and raw materials are produced on the land, controlled by the property owners. Property owners sustain farmers and laborers, as well as artisans and manufacturing work. To the extent that raw materials are worked into fine goods, if the owners live in the cities far from their lands, they also must support those and their horses who transport the products to the city. So and their cars and transportation, right? So now we're on to chapter six, capital cities. Wherever a government establishes its capital city, the city will grow in size because the additional spending attracts labor and businesses to service the government and its employees, and thus it becomes a commercial center for the nation as well. A capital city is formed in the same way as a, proven a provincial city. With these differences, the, long, the largest property owners in the state reside in the capital. The king or supreme government is established in it and spends the government's revenues there. The supreme courts of justice are located there. It is the center of the fashions, which all the provinces take as their model. So the trend. And the property owners who reside in the provinces occasionally spend time in the capital, and they send their children there to be educated. Therefore, all the lands in the state contribute more or less to the maintenance or to maintain those who dwell in the capital. Wherever a government establishes a capital, the city will grow in size because the additional spending attracts labor and businesses to service the government and its employees, thus it becomes a commercial center. If a sovereign leader leaves a city to establish residence in another, nobles will follow him and locate their residence with him in the new city, which will become great and important at the expense of the first. We have seen a recent example of this in the city of, Pitts, of Petersburg to the disadvantage of Moscow, and one sees many old cities where were important and they fall to ruin and others spring from their ashes. Great cities usually are built on the sea 
or on the coast or on the banks of large rivers for the convenience of transportation, water, for t water transportation of products and merchandise necessary for subsistence and comfort of the inhabitants is much cheaper than wagons and land transportation. That's the same today. So, that Russian reference was in uh, reference to the capital, moving the capital of Russia to Petersburg in 1713. So, it's like, a, it's a big deal. Notice that Kantian again mentions the important importance of transportation costs. Four-wheel wagon. The cost of transportation. On to chapter 7. The labor of the plowman is of less value than that of the artisan. The opportunity cost of becoming a skilled worker includes both the direct expenses as well as the foregone labor during the training period or apprenticeship. As a result, skilled workers must be paid higher wages than unskilled workers. A laborer's son at 7 to 12 years of age begins to help his father either in keeping the herds, digging the ground, or in other sorts of country labor that require no art or skill. If his father has him taught a trade, he loses his assistance during the time of his apprenticeship and is obliged to clothe him and to pay the expenses of his apprenticeship for many years. The son is thus dependent on his father, and his labor brings no advantage for several years. The working life of man is estimated to be only 10 or 12 years, and as several are lost in learning a trade, most of which in England require several years of apprenticeship, a plowsman would never be willing to have a trade taught to his son if the artisans did not earn more than the plowsman. This is where Kantian explains the opportunity cost of apprenticeship, similar to the opportunity cost of college, where the father has to pay for the apprenticeship or tuition and loses the child's labor for several years. Kantian includes the cost of clothing, which would not apply in the case of college because children who work on the farm help to make their own clothes, but children in apprenticeships do not. So they don't make their own things. So, as it ends, a plowsman would never be willing to have a trade taught to his son if the artisan did not earn more than the plowsman. Therefore, those who employ artisans or professionals must pay for their labor at a higher rate than that of a plowman or a common laborer. Their labor will necessarily be expensive in proportion to the time lost in learning the trade and the cost and risk incurred in becoming proficient. The professionals themselves do not make all their children learn their tr own trade. There would be too many of them for their needs of the city or the state, and many would not find enough work. However, the work is naturally better paid than that of a plowsman. As they say, learn to code. Chapter 8. Some artisans earn more, others less, according to different cases and circumstances. In addition to training and the forces of supply and demand, workers with higher quality skills, risky jobs, or jobs which require trustworthy employees will receive higher wages. This is now known as the theory of compensating differentials that is often attributed to Adam Smith. If two tailors make all the clothes of a village, one may have more customers than the other, whether from his way of attracting business, because his products are better or more, dur more durable than the other, or because he follows the fashions better in style of his garments. And if one dies, the other, finding himself with more work, will be able to raise the price of his labor, expediting the work 
of some in preference to the others, until the villagers find it to their advantage to have their clothes made in another village, town, or city, losing the time spent in going and returning, or until another tailor comes to live in their village and shares the business. The, job, the jobs which require the most time and training or most ingenuity and industry must necessarily be paid the best. A skillful cabinet maker must receive a higher price for his work than an ordinary carpenter, and a good clock and watchmaker more than a blacksmith. The artisans and occupations which are accompanied by risks and dangers, like those of foundry workers, sailors, silver miners, etc., ought to be paid in proportion to the risks. When skill is needed, over and above the dangers, they ought to be paid even more, such as a ship pilot, divers, and engineers. When capacity and trustworthiness are needed, the labor is paid still more highly, and in the case of jewelers, bookkeepers, cashiers, and others. By these examples, and a hundred others we could draw from ordinary experience, it is easily seen that the differences in the prices paid for labor is based upon natural and obvious reasons. So, on to chapter 9. The number of laborers, artisans, and others who work in a state is naturally proportioned to the demand for them. The supply of workers adjusts itself to the demand for labor across all professions via wage rates, migration, and changes in population. Prosperity cannot be created by subsidizing job training. Ooh, we see that a lot now, don't we? Prosperity cannot be created by subsidizing job training. If all the farm or laborers in a village raise several sons to the same work, there will be too many farm laborers to cultivate the lands of the village, and the surplus adults will have to leave in order to seek a livelihood elsewhere, which they generally find in cities. If some remain with their fathers, as they will not find sufficient employment, they will live in great poverty, and will not marry for a lack of means to raise children. If they do marry, their children will soon die of starvation, with their parents, as we see every day in France. So you see there was a lot of pressure going on there, wasn't there? Therefore, if the village continues in the same employment pattern, and derives its living from cultivating the same area of land, its population will not increase in a thousand years. It is true that the women and girls of, of this village can, when they are not working in the fields, occupy themselves in spinning, knitting, or other work that can be sold in the cities. However, this rarely suffices to support the extra children who leave the village to seek their fortune elsewhere. The same may be said of the artisans of a village. If a tailor makes all the clothes for a village and then raises three sons to do the same job, there will only be enough work for one successor to him, and the other two must seek their living elsewhere. If they do not find employment in the neighboring town, they must move further and further away to change their occupation and earn a living by becoming servants, soldiers, and sailors, etc. By the same process of reasoning, it is easy to conceive that the laborers, artisans, and others who earn their living by working must proportion themselves in number to the employment and demand for them in market towns and cities. If four tailors are enough to make all the clothes for a town and a fifth arrives, he may find some work at the expense of the other four. Therefore, if the labor is divided between the five tailors, neither of them will have enough work and each one will live more poorly. It often happens that laborers and artisans do not have enough employment when there are too many of them to share the business. It also happens that they can be deprived of work by accidents and by variations in demand, or that they are overburdened with work, according to the circumstances. 
be that as in May, when they have no work, they leave the villages, towns, and cities where they live in such numbers. And those who remain are always proportioned to the employment that suffices to maintain them. When there is a continuous increase of work, there are gains to be made and others will move in to share the business. From this, it is easy to understand that the charity schools in England, with the proposals and the, or, and the proposals in France to increase the number of artisans, are useless. If the king of France sent 100,000 of his subjects at the expense into Holland to learn seafaring, they would be of no use when they returned if there were no more vessels if no more vessels were sent to sea than before. So if there's no more going out, then you know they become useless sailors. It is true that it would be a great advantage for a state to teach its subjects to produce the manufactured goods that are customarily drawn from abroad and all the other articles brought there. But I am at present only considering the state in relation to itself. It should be remembered that Kantian in his time France was suffering under an economic policy of severe mercantilism where all manufacturing was highly restricted, monopolized, heavily taxed, and closely regulated. Therefore, manufactured goods, primarily textiles, were sold at high prices, and this encouraged imports. Kantian found that by subsidizing training, He was both expensive and unnecessary in a free economy because skilled labor would be supplied if there was demand, as he stated in the following paragraph. The art, as the artisans earn more than the laborers, they are better able to raise their children into professions, and there will be a lack of artisans in a state where there is enough work for their constant employment. Or, and there will never be a lack of artisans in a state where there is enough work for their constant employment. Kantian, used, Kantian will emphasize throughout the essay that manufacturing should be allowed to grow to its largest natural extent because manufacturing labor earns higher wages. He was definitely for the laborer. Chapter 10 The prince and intrinsic value of a thing, in general, is the measurement of the land and labor which enters into its products. Intrinsic value can be measured by the quantity of labor. I already messed that up. It's too late. I'll have to cut this one. Start on chapter 10. Once again, with a new video. Well, this one's been long enough. Make some snips or something. Well, thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe and all that. Have a good day, everybody.